cold fusion. Yeah. This this idea, this dream, uh, this interesting f- physical goals s- seem to be impossible, uh, but perhaps it's possible. Do you think it is possible? Do you think down the line somewhere in in um, in the far distance it's possible to achieve fusion at a low temperature? It's very, very, very unlikely. Um, and this comes from, um, so this would require a pretty fundamental shift in our understanding of, of physics like, of, as we know it now. And we know a heck of a lot about how nuclear reactions occur. Um, but by the way, what's interesting is that there's, they, they actually have a different name for it. They call it leaner, like low energy nuclear reactions. But we do have low energy nuclear reactions. We know these. It's because these come from, uh, particularly the weak um, interaction, uh, the weak force, uh, nuclear force, and so it's at this point, um, I, you know, as a scientist, you always keep yourself open because, but you also demand proof, right? And that's the thing. It almost requires a breakthrough on, on the theoretical physics side. So something, uh, some deeper understanding about yeah. quantum mechanics, something. So the quantum tunneling, some some weird. Yeah, and that, and and people have looked at that, but even like something like quantum tunneling has a limit as to what it can actually do. So there there are people who are genuine, you know, that that really want to see it make. It, but you know, it sort of goes to the extort. I mean. We know fusion happens at these high energies, like the, 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 when we know this extremely accurately, and I can show you a, a plot that shows that as you go to lower and lower energy, it basically becomes immeasurable. So if you're going down this other pathway, it means there's really a very different physical mechanism involved. Um, so um, all I would say is that I, I I actually poke in my head once in a while to see what's going on. In that area, um, and as scientists, we should always try to make ourselves open. Um, and uh, but in this one, it's like, but show me something that I can measure and that is repeatable, and then and then it then it's going to take more extraordinary effort. And, and to date, this has not met that threshold, in my opinion. Yeah. So I'm even more so than just mentioning or in that question, thinking about people that are claiming to have achieved cold fusion. Yeah. I'm more thinking even about people who are studying black holes and they're, they're basically trying to understand the function of, you know, theoretical physicists. Yeah. They're doing the, the long haul, yeah, look, trying to yeah, investigate yeah, yeah. like, okay, what is happening at the singularity? What is uh, this kind of uh, holographic projections on a plate, these weird, freaking things that are out there in the universe and like somehow accidentally they start to figure out something weird weird yeah and then all of a sudden there's weirdness all (laughs) over the place already yeah somehow that weirdness will yeah i think on a time scale probably of 100 years or so that weirdness will open yeah uh so it, it just seems like nuclear fusion and black holes and all of this are too they're next door neighbors a little bit yeah. too much for like you'll find something yeah. interesting well, let me tell you a story about this yes okay a re, it's a real story okay so there were really really clever scientists in the in the end of the late 1800s in the world you talk about like james clerk maxwell and you talk about lord kelvin uh, and you talk about lorentz actually who named after these other ones and you yeah, on and on and on and like faraday and they discovered electromagnetism holy cow and it's like they figure out all these things and yet there were these weird things going on that you couldn't quite figure out it's like what the heck is going on with this right but we, we teach this all the time in, in, in physics classes, right? So what was going on? Well, there's just a few, there's just a few kind of things, things unchecked, but basically we're at the end of discovery because we figured out how everything works. Because mm-hmm. we've got we've got basically Newtonian mechanics and we've got Maxwell's equations, which describe basically how matter gets pushed around and how electromagnetism works. Holy cow, what a feat. But there are these few nagging things. Like For instance, there's certain kinds of rocks that for some reason, like if you put a photographic plate around it, it like gets burned or it gets an image on it. Like, well, where's the electromagnetism in that? There's no electromagnetic properties of this rock. Hmm. Oh yeah, and the other thing too is that if I... If I take this wonderful classical derivation of how something that is hot, about how it releases radiation, everything looks fantastic. Perfect match 
oh, until I get to high frequencies of, of the light. And then it basically just, the whole thing falls apart. In fact, it gives a physical explanation, which is total nonsense. It tells you that every object should basically be producing an infinite amount of heat. Mm-hmm. And by the way, here's the sun, and we can look at the sun, and we can figure out it's made out of hydrogen. And Lord Kelvin actually made a very famous you know, calculation, who was basically one of the founders of thermodynamics. So you look at the hydrogen, hydrogen has a certain energy content, you know the latent heat basically of hydrogen, we know the mass of the sun because we knew the size of it, and he conclusively proved that basically there could only, the, the sun could only make net energy for about two or three thousand years. So therefore all this nonsense about like deep, it's like because clearly the sun can only last for two or three thousand years. If you think about the, chem- and this is basically the chemical energy content of hydrogen, and what comes along in one decade, Basically, one guy sitting in a postal office, you know, in Switzerland, figures out that all of these, you know, Einstein, of course, which was like figured out all this, cra- like took these these seemingly unconnected things, and it's like, boom, there it is. This is what well, it wasn't just him, but it was like there's quantum physics. Like this explains this other disaster, and then this other guy, my hero, Ernest Rutherford, experimentalist, did the most extraordinary experiment, which is like which was that, okay, they had these funny rocks. They emitted these particles. They, in fact, they called them alpha particles. Alpha, just A in the alphabet, right? Because it was the first thing that they discovered. And what were they doing? So they were they were taking these alpha particles, and I, by the way, I do this to all my students because it's a demonstration of what you should be as a good scientist. So he took these alpha things, and he was a classically trained physicist, knew everything about momentum scattering and so forth and like that. And he took this, and these alpha, which clearly were some kind of energy, but they couldn't quite figure out what it was. So he said, let's try to figure that. We'll actually use this to try to probe the nature of matter. Mm-hmm. So he took this, took these alpha particles, and a very, very thin gold foil. And so what you wanted to see was that as they were going through, the way that they would scatter based on classical, in fact, the Coulomb collision, mm-hmm. based on classical mechanics, this will tell me, reveal something about what the nature of the charge distribution is in matter because they didn't know. Like, where the hell is this stuff coming from? Even though they'd solved electromagnetism, they didn't know, like, what made up charges. Mm-hmm. Okay, very interesting. On Through it goes. Do, 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 do. And so what did you set up? So it turns out in the, in these experiments, what you did was, because if these, al- these so-called alphas, which actually now we know is something else, as they go through, they would deflect. How much they deflect tells you how strong an electric field they saw. So you put detectors, because if you put if you put like a piece of glass in front of this, what will happen is that when the alpha particle hits, it literally gives a little boom, a little boom of light like this. It scintillates, a little blue flash. So he would train his students or postdocs or whatever the heck they were at the time. You have to train yourself because you have to put yourself in the dark for like mm-hmm. hours to get your eyes adjusted. And then they would start the experiment and they would sit there and literally count the things. And they could see this pattern developing, which was revealing about what was going on. But there was also another part to the experiment, which was that it's like, here's the alphas, here's the source, they're going this way. They could tell they were going in one direction only, basically. They're going in this direction. And you put all these over here because you want to see how they deflect and bend through it. But you put a control in the experiment, but you basically put glass glass, glass plates back here. Because obviously, Everything should just deflect, but nothing should bounce back. So it's a control in the experiment. Mm-hmm. But what did what did they see? They they saw things bouncing back. Like what the hell? Like that fit no model of any idea, right? But Rutherford like refused to like ignore what was a clear like they validated it, and he sat down and based on classical physics, he made the most extraordinary discovery which was the nucleus, which is a very, very strange discovery. What, what I mean by that, because what he could figure out from this is that in order for these particles to bounce back and hit this plate, they were hitting something that must be heavier than them, and that, that basically something like 99.999% of the mass of the matter that was in this gold foil was in something that contained uh, about one trillionth of the volume of it. Mm-hmm. And that's called the nucleus. And until, and you talk about, so how revealing is this? It's like, this totally changes your idea of the universe yeah. because a nucleus is a very unintuitive, non-intuitive thing. It's like, why is all the mass 
in something that is like zero, like it basically is the realization that matter is empty. Mm-hmm. It's all empty space. Yeah, and that changes everything. And it changes everything. Until you had that, like you had steam engines, by the way, you had telegraph wires, you had all those things. Yeah. But that that realization like opened up, those two realizations opened up everything, like lasers, Every, all these think about the modern world of what we use and that set it up so all i would point out is that there's a story already that sometimes there's these nagging things at the edge of science that you know we seem we, we pat ourselves on the back and we think we got everything under control and of course that by the way that was the origin of also of that that it think about this that was 1908 it took like another 20 some years before people put that together with that's the process that's powering stars Mm-hmm. It was the rearrangement of those nuclei, not atoms. That's why Kelvin wasn't wrong. He just he was working with the wrong assumptions, right? So uh, f- fast forward to today, like what would this mean, right? Well, there's a couple of things like this that sit out there in physics. And I'll point out one of them, which is very interesting. We don't know what the hell makes up 90% of the mass in the universe. Mm-hmm. So, the, you know, the search for dark matter, right? Mm-hmm. What is it? We still haven't discovered it. Yeah. 90% of the mass of the universe is undetectable. Like what? And then, you know, and dark energy, and the, again, black holes are the, the yeah. window into this. The well, the black then holes. black hole, I mean, sometimes black holes are way better understood <laughs> than, than those things as well too. So all it tells us is that we shouldn't have hubris about the ideas that we understand everything. And when we, you know, who knows what other, the next major intellectual insight will be about how the universe, you know, functions. And actually, I think Rutherford is the one who's attributed at least that uh, that quote that physics is the only real science; everything else is stamp collecting, right? So uh, there's. I'm sorry, he's my hero, but I'll slightly disagree with that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, no offense to stamp collecting; it's yeah. very important too. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. you know that you have to have humility about the kind of disciplines that make progress at every stage in in science. Yeah. In, in science, yeah, exactly. That physics did make a huge amount of progress in the 20th century, but it's possible that other disciplines start to step in. Yeah, but Rutherford couldn't imagine like mapping the human genome because we didn't even know about DNA. Yeah, or computers, really. Or computers. He really probably didn't think deeply I mean, about who computation. Knows? It's like, is it? Here's here's a wild one. What if like the next great revelation to humanity about the universe is not done by the human mind. That seems increasingly likely. more yeah, likely. Yes, yeah. And then you start to ask deep questions about what is the purpose of science? For example, if an um, AI system will design a nuclear fusion reactor better than humans do, but we don't quite understand how it works, and the AI can't, we know that it works. We can test it very thoroughly, mm-hmm. but we don't know exactly what the control mechanisms is, maybe what the chemistry, the physics is. Uh, AI can't quite explain it. They just can't. It's it's, it's a, impenetrable to our consciousness, yeah. basically, uh, of trying to hold it all together. And then, and then, okay, so now we're living in that world where many of the biggest discoveries are made by AI systems. Yeah. <laughs> As if we weren't going big. I, yeah, I, yeah, I say you know it's again. I'll point out like when my when I, when my godmother was born, like we, none of this was in front of us, right? It's like yeah. we live in an amazing time. It's like right, like my grandfather, you know, plowed you know fields with a horse. I get to work on designing fusion reactors. Yeah, yeah, pretty amazing time. But still, there's humans, so we'll see. We'll see. We'll see if that's around a hundred yeah. years. Maybe it'll be uh, oh, cyborgs yeah. I, I and robots. Pretty, I think we're pretty resilient, actually. <laughs> yeah, no. That's, that's, that's one lesson from life is it uh, finds a way. 